you've done it all in your head subconsciously for a long time. And I think for you know anyone who's making things, if it's such a direct process, you're probably not doing anything that interesting. If you keep going back to some of the things you did in the experiments, you can really find your way and start to direct it a little better because you've got this giant library. Welcome to MakeCast. I'm Dale Doherty. MakeCast is brought to you by the members of Make Community, who support makers in their community and around the world. To learn more about membership, visit make.co. Industrial designer Neil Cohen is talking about the giant library that is full of ways to transform ordinary stuff into meaningful things, even beautiful things. This isn't the kind of design where you are asking people what they want and then designing it for them. It's designing something that they don't yet know they want. It's how you make things that don't yet exist. Something original rather than a copy. Some of what I do in my work is mm -hmm. making something that starts out one way and then when you do something to it, it forms into something else or reveals something else. And it's even in some of my more sophisticated work and some of the unsophisticated things where I try to find that in the work I'm doing through the shapes and the sculpting and the making. Introduce yourself, just give us some background on, your, on, on who you are and what you do. <laughs> I'm definitely a maker. I've been making things since I'm a real young child. We had a basement and a backyard and an entire neighborhood where you could do things with the things you made. And so I started making things of my own, including all the plans from popular science, like hang gliders and sail cars and things that had motors on them. And a lot of tinkering went on, but also a lot of what we'll call ad hoc, where things we could find that we couldn't afford or things that we had or things we scrounged up from a dumpster went into making some of the things and those things were useful to us, me, my friends and I that made things. We drove stuff around the neighborhood that was this sort of concoction of things. We used whatever we could find and whatever we could buy to put together and craft certain kinds of things. And in doing that, really acquired a, a lot of skills, including recognizing things, recognizing the kinds of things you could do. And it meant that you had to be a little bit handy, but it also meant growing up doing those things that you could also be a lot more inventive than just buying something off the shelf. Right. Yeah. I, I get the sense it had a lot to do with your imagination, didn't it? Always. Anybody would, would say the thing they wanted to do when they were a kid was to fly. Everybody wants to fly. Who doesn't want to fly? So how would you do that? Everybody's tried jumping off the stairway with an umbrella and that's not too successful. Making things that allowed you to do that. I used a sled and built things onto that so that I could do the Wright Brothers thing off of a small cliff in my uh, neighborhood. And that worked with a little bit of bumps and bruises. The invention part of it is, what can I get away with? What can I stick together that'll do this? Or what can I find and do something to it that gives me some kind of result that's satisfying? And some of those results as an artist are nothing. They're just the end product. It's not anything. It's not anything you do anything with. It just does something. There are plenty of things like that in the world that just are. Sculptors like Calders and things, they just move in the wind, not a big deal, but how they do it and why they do it and why things balance, I think takes a bit of play really. And I think that for successful people in any area, there's a risk and there's a sense of playfulness that one might acquire over time that says, I should try that, or I can do that, or why does it do that? And I think those are some of the best questions to start out with is looking at something or maybe imagining something that you'd like to do to try to figure out how am I going to get there? That's the thing I think that's always been amazing through my work and my hobbies, let's say, and my professional life. And a lot of the end results is how do you get there? Some of it is very amorphic and not direct. It's not always linear. Sometimes you've got to stand on your head to see it the right way. And I think that's the fun of it is when you finally get there and tell people how you got there, they're very surprised. And you look at them and say, it seems natural to me to stand this way or turn it upside down or turn it inside out or rip it in half and put the two ends together that weren't touching. And now it works. How did you make a connection between those things you were doing in your backyard, in your basement, and where you wanted to go with in your life, and where you wanted to go to school, and what you wanted to do. 
The school part was a bit of a surprise to me. I didn't know that there was such thing as a design school when I was growing up. I was much more interested in biographies of people who invented stuff like Thomas Edison or George Washington Carver or someone, Eli Whitney. And I read all those things as a young kid and said, it's so interesting that they figured out ways to do something that were brand new or never worked before, or there was no reason for it to exist until they invented it. And sometimes they invented the problem and then invented the answer. And that always intrigued me is that you don't always, you're not always furnished with a problem. Sometimes for inventive people, you've invented that problem. And you're the first one that ever thought that was a problem. No one knew until you said so. And then you hand over the result and say, here's what I imagined to be a problem. And I'm one in a million. So I did the math many times. There were billions of people. There must be millions just like me who've got the same problem. I've solved it. I did it. I think that's a great idea. I, I think it's hard to get people to understand that sometimes you invent a problem. Things differently enough that it, the problem manifests itself to you, right? It isn't yeah, something I, you go out and ask a bunch of people and say, is, is this a problem for you? And that would be marketing. Right. Marketing people are the ones that go out there and say, is this a problem? Inventors are the ones that say, I'm going to create a problem. Right. <laughs> and, and once you've done that, for some reason, it could be anything. You could call them the mother of invention, but it's not always that way. The guy Pilates was in bed on his back for a long time until he figured out that he could exercise in some way using the pulleys and the weights that were keeping him in traction. And things yeah. like that appeal to me so much, those stories, but also the accidents that happen, which i you know, often been able to reveal the, those accidents in my work professionally to say, this was something I stumbled upon. I'm only partly responsible for it other than the fact that I tripped over it while doing something else. And suddenly this was revealed. And I said, huh, I can probably exploit that in a great way and do something with it that is going to have value to, at least to me and my soul, but maybe other people. And I think that's proven actually for me to be some of the very, very best work I've ever done. And some of those things have gone nowhere and they're still the best things I've ever done. They've never been presented. They're still a secret some way and somehow, but they're the best. The assignments are almost never of the same depth of what I would bring to it because they're already figured out. They're already understanding what the metrics are and what the numbers are and how much it should cost and so on in my professional work. I'm even given sometimes the size of the box it will be in before I ever am told what it's gonna be. They know how many they need to get in a trailer load before it gets on the shelf of a store in order to squeeze out $19.99 from it. And I don't know that's the best you know, approach, but. It's an approach that works in, in, in that world. Can, I can skewer it in a different way and try to bring something to my party where they're looking at it and say, huh, that's interesting. How do we turn that into something that we can use? So just to state the obvious here, you're a product designer. I'm an um, industrial designer. I'm right. a patented inventor. I'm definitely a maker of things from scratch. And when I say scratch, hot glue and toothpicks and macaroni and those sorts of things so that I can figure out in a Frankenstein kind of way, what's it supposed to be? What could it be? And how will it do what I want it to do? How will it behave? That's the most, to me, the, the behavior tells you everything, how it will look, what it can do, and maybe stretching the limits of that once you understand what it might do. That's where I really come in very handily to mm -hmm. what, what I, my objectives are. You went to RISD. Uh, Rhode Island School of Design. Um, curious if you did this stuff as a kid and then you go to school and it's a more formal view <laughs> of all these things. I actually think it's it's a wonderful combination for people who can do both. We sometimes see today that kids just have the formal knowledge and they don't actually have the practice that they developed on their own going right. into that. Um, but how, how did school help hold you back, push you forward? What, what did it do for you? <laughs> I have a good answer for that, which was told to me at the very end, which I really appreciated. A, a mentor of mine, a teacher, a professor at Rhode Island School of Design said to me, Neil, every year or so we find someone who comes in with a lot. And what we try to do is unwind that one person and rewind them. They've got everything they need without us, but 
we unwind that and turn it into something that can be set loose in the world and be productive. And I really appreciated that because I know they were talking about me at that time and what it is I might do and bring to the world and the profession given what they saw in the first place in my formative years as a student in junior high and high school. And those are the things you present, of course, to the university to get into the university so that they can at least see that you have some acumen or some talent or some way of seeing. And I think the job of a college is not to get you ready to be completely productive yet. It's academic. And that was the thing I think I recognized the second I stepped into that arena in my uh, senior year at, at high school was to go see the schools and say, wow, that's what I want to be doing. And they were doing the next step that I was already doing. And I could see myself becoming part of that and becoming a, a, an important part of that really as a student and really expose a lot of the things that I had already been thinking about, but had now the grounds for doing it, the place for doing it, the studios and the people. And a lot of things that I saw there at the time were unmakeable. In my mind, I didn't have enough depth or experience or hands-on with any of the things that were being done and suddenly, you're forced into situations where lots of people are making things and they're all over the place. And so there are all kinds of ways to make things, including ones that were almost not understandable until they showed you how they did it. And sometimes it was a secret. And I really love that. At school, there were a lot of things that happened there in those years when I went, which were revealed by people and they were not so obvious. They were things where you would look at the end product and still scratch your head and say, how did they do that? And even if you didn't ask that question is, how the hell did they come up with that? Like, why would they ever have done that? It's like marshmallows or things of that kind where you say, who would ever think that anyone would ever want to eat a marshmallow, but they didn't exist. And someone probably produced something like that one day and said, get it? Marshmallows. This is going to be big. And it's so exciting to me when I saw those things, because in school, those things are not employed. It's many years later. It could be 15 years later down the road when you see something that was done at the academic level and you say to yourself, wow, that's not new, but it's the first time I've seen it out there in the public. It's so incredible that it took that long for it to get ready for prime time. And that's so exciting to me because I have books filled with things that I've drawn and photographs of things I've cobbled together. And I have presented them for years and it could be 20 years later, when they're finally ready for the public and the marketing people to understand it, because we're ahead. We're thinking ahead. We're not thinking about necessarily the market yet. We're inventing things that there's no need for them until maybe one day it catches up. And I think that's really a, a lot of fun because yeah. you, don't have, you don't have all the abilities to bring it to market. You just have an ability to present it and say, here, what do you think yeah. of this? <laughs> That's a, 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 I think it's one of the things that bothers me sometimes the way like entrepreneurship is talked about and things that it's almost so oriented towards the market. Whereas what I've found in makers and a lot of creative people is often there's this rich area that they explore that has nothing to do with the market. Sometimes that stuff moves into a market and it yes. becomes successful. Yeah. But when I saw making, and it wasn't that people were saying like, how do I make money on this? They were saying, what does it do? How does it work? What could it be? And those were explorations that if they had been framed as don't do that unless there's a market opportunity for it, they would have never done that playful exploration of it. And you're right. And the playful exploration on the academic side or the personal side or the hobby side can go on forever without any end and without any way to extract money from it or any kind of commerce and it's beautiful on its own it's just stuff it's just things it's just materials it's parts it's things of that nature though that you leave on the desk behind you like you've got and you keep looking at it and one day it becomes part of something else you're doing and suddenly it's easy to understand it it's exploitable yeah. and it's so exciting because suddenly its reason for existing goes beyond your imagination and in in commerce in companies there are not that many companies 
that will fund and will support that kind of thinking for years and years. The old story where the guy comes in and sits at his desk and looks out the window all day and everybody sees him doing that and doesn't seem like anything's produced, but eventually it's revealed that he's the guy that invented product number one and idea number seven and so on. And finally the CEO comes by and says, I think we need to give him a bigger window. And I always love that because it looks like you're daydreaming and doing nothing. People see paychecks and people see what you did with your money and people see what you built and all of that. And those are the results of going to work every day. People don't see the process of the inventor. Yeah. They don't know what it takes. They don't know the how, whether it's about commerce or ambition or something kookball going on there that is going to lead maybe, but not necessarily. And that's the risk, really, I think, that a lot of people don't ever take and will never understand is that it could lead to nothing. There's no paycheck at the end. There's nothing necessarily going to come from it, nothing. And so people will ask them, why do you waste your time doing that? And that's the thing I'll never be able to answer because yeah. I don't think it's a waste in any way, shape or form. Thought of it as like creative risk is really hard to explain to people to sure. believe in an idea and do it. And maybe it goes nowhere, but you've actually taught yourself something about the risks that it's, it's worth it's, explaining it and engaging it and you grow as a result of those things that fail miserably as well as the things that do succeed most of it fails miserably, miserably yes <laughs> and that's the great thing about it and but here's the funny thing of all of those failures the percentage of successes which is tiny they usually they make it worth it they're just part of the process you understand how to take a punch almost all the time and you understand how to accept that loss because it simply puts you maybe on the road or maybe on hold for a little while to think more about it you failed uh, and i don't mean selling it it just doesn't do what it's supposed to do and you've got to try it again and it's very much hands-on because you have to keep making those things until they do operate or they do perform or they do stand properly or they do last or whatever they're supposed to do in your imagination and the first time out if you can get it the very first time you're probably not inventing anything just you probably aren't because it's more of a process there's an idea and a seed and you have to really grow that seed until it becomes mm -hmm. what you really hope for it to become. You don't always know where it's going to go. Right. Now, what were your experiences right out of college then? So I was incredibly lucky time and place. I had a trip I took right after college. I bought myself a nice two-cylinder BMW motorcycle and I packed it with a Kodak slide reel and some clothes and I drove it to almost 40 states in the United States. I stopped at phone booths. You know what those are? <laughs> I looked at yellow pages and tore the pages out for companies that do design work and that have industrial design departments. And I probably made over a hundred interviews with no intent on staying anywhere. And it confused everyone I interviewed. They said, so are you gonna be in town? Are you gonna stay in Cincinnati? Are you gonna?" And I said, nope, just interviewing. And they wondered, what are you doing that for? And I said, I wanna see what everyone's doing. And I want to show everyone what I've been doing. And that led to me in California to finally see some of the well-known firms out there in many areas, including factories that made things Xerox and GK did motorcycles for Yamaha. And there were all kinds of things. But what I exposed myself to in those five or six months riding motorcycle and going to these different places was everybody's working on products. And all of those things are already pre-planned in terms of what they do, how they'll work. It was wonderful, but it really didn't intrigue me. It just didn't. It was all the same except for different materials. Everyone's process was very similar. And I turned around and I drove a beeline back to New York and I got a job offer through a, a branch of Corning, which was Stu Ben, which was the furthest thing I ever thought I'd be doing given what they were making at the time, decorative gifts, for heads of state, engraved things that I had no interest in, dusty sort of things that would sit on credenzas and so on. And that opportunity turned out to be one of the greatest moments for me of a period of four years, not only of seeding some really formal ideas that I had and some very experimental things, working with a material that's ancient and brand new at the same time. So the technology they had was fantastic. And what was available to me, to my hands, and a 
ton of craftsmen and all kinds of people was something you could never dream of having at your disposal. So I worked in their factories and I worked at their tech centers and I watched glass being made into things I'd never seen before. And all of it was still the same material, which was part of what made it so cool was it was just glass in every single case. And looking at one material and seeing how many different things you could do with it was really the, the beginning of, of my return to academics thinking really is how many things, what can you do with this stuff? And the answer is anything. It was unbelievable to me how many things can be done in and with glass and those kinds of materials, given the tools and the people and all the other experiments that had been done. And I just thought, this is the greatest. It yeah. really was it, Is that like opening a world of like how many different techniques there are and how many different techniques. ways of doing things? That's funny. The techniques are cheap. You can do, you can use them. That's easy. You look at a machine and you see what it does and you can borrow anyone's technique. But I think what Glass offered to me was not really technique, but trying to imagine what it could become in any form that was available. It's a liquid, it's a solid, it's the in-between, it's stretchy, it's bubbles, it's hard surfaces, it's carved. It's so many things and those are technical things, but what do you want it to be? And why would you even make that? And they let me spend almost two years generating nothing. That was the beauty of that job. There was nothing on my shoulders saying, you've got to make something that we can sell. So I had an opportunity following college to continue doing that while working in an industry that was serious commerce. They made fiber optics. They made flat screen TV screens and, and Gorilla Glass and electronic glass and pyroceram and all kinds of things for catalytic converters. And I learned all about that stuff. But the things they were making inherently were beautiful without any design, just the structures and how structures happened and how glass got formed and how it got finished and all, all technical, sure, but what do you do with it? And what could you do with it that hasn't been done? And the opportunity to show a group of people, professionals, you could do this, or you can do this, or it becomes this when you do this to it. And all of that was really just a, a, a sincere um, um, effort to, not make things, not make products, but just go through a process of understanding what could you do with this? And is the result beautiful? Is it natural? Is it forced? Yeah. All of that. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is to explore the connection between design and making, and to some degree how it's disconnected often today. But it sounds like in that glass factory, the yeah. two were hand in hand, right? That, oh, that, yes. that you, you weren't just dreaming ideas of things in a different room and sending it to someone else to make it. You Never. were in an environment where you were making the things you were dreaming of. We, we were caused to do that. We had to spend time with factory labor and we had to sometimes do it ourselves too. I've been in lots of glass factories in the world where they didn't know what I meant. They didn't know what I really wanted. And I would say to them, to their surprise, let me show you, I can do it. Let me show you what I mean. And I would do things in their factory that they didn't do because they weren't willing to exploit the tools and they had such a strong technical eth ethic that they weren't willing to go outside of the technical realm that they were familiar with. And I said, it doesn't matter right now. It's not a product. There's no commerce, there's nothing. Let me just show you what I mean. And what I mean is the thing I've become really good at conveying to people who have to make it on the other side. But knowing what it should or could do, or even the predictability has become something that you, you can do that, fortunately and unfortunately, because the more you predict, the more narrow you become and you know what it's going to do and you know how you can squeeze uh, your living out of it. And suddenly you're stuck with doing these things that work already. And what you want to do is you want to work on things that you understand already, but you also absolutely want to get back to the heart of it and work on things you don't understand. You don't fully know what it can be. That's the only way you can make new things. How did your life proceed from the glass factory? Did you I, become a product designer then? Yeah, I really became a product designer, but I also became a product of an industry that had tremendous tentacles out there in the real world. And that I thought was quite exciting also because what I learned was, is that glass was not being abandoned. In fact, it was being embraced and there was opportunity any corner of the world where there's sand, glass has been made for 5,000 years into something. And 
it was considered the material of kings, really. Things made of glass were a rich man's thing until it became very accessible. And suddenly you could use it and make it for anything. And things people needed and pe things people didn't need. And so the range was so wide that you realized it's everywhere. And so are plastics and so is wood and so is lots of stuff. But it seemed like this material still is incredibly luxurious no matter how cheap it is. And I love that about it because there's something I can always exercise in it and find in it that just, it, it's, it, it's hard to ruin it. It's hard to blow the whole thing. And what I like about it is intrinsic to that material, but that work, that job, which was for Stu Ben, which has come and gone a few times, it's had a few lifetimes. That job led me to the other factory businesses in the glass making industry and all things glass. And to become a sort of um, ethereally an expert in glass, not technically, is something that I really have embraced for many years when people come to me or ask me to do a project for them in an area that isn't necessarily my area, but it's still glass. They wanna know what they can do with it. And I think that's appropriate when you're talking to a person who really is still able to play with it. But nevertheless, I've done thousands of other kinds of projects in areas that require a lot of play, including toy companies. So I've done a lot of work for Hasbro and a little bit of work for Mattel and Tyco Toy Company and Vinnie and Smith Crayola. And all of them have come to me and said, what would you do with this? Or let us send you some stuff and tell us what you might do with it. Could materials be, or? It could be materials. It could be a, a process that they came upon. Okay. It could be something that an inventor as well brought to them and still they don't know really what to do with it. And th th those are exciting opportunities too, because if you have enough time and certainly from a company paid enough money, you can actually tear it down and make lots of calls and judgments and so on as to what you can do with it. And some of those things will be terribly useless and fun as anything. And that's probably what makes a good toy. And in lots of areas, what do you do to make something simple from complicated parts? What do you do to take something really complicated and make it really simple so it's makeable? That takes a lot of play. You have to be able to look at it from lots of angles and turn it upside down and say, you know, if you would just do this and flip it and stretch it and poke this one hole in it, it suddenly becomes exactly what you need it to be. They never had it in mind that way. They're so specific sometimes as to what they need it to be that they just miss so many of the opportunities that a good playful inventor can bring to it. And the result in many areas is that when people find things that they like, they can't quite tell you what they like about it. They just like it. And that I think is one of the most important things is not necessarily why do they buy it, but why do they love it? And is there I, one of those processes around a toy that you could talk about? There are lots of them, really. I love shrink wrap. I just love shrink wrap. I love doing stuff with it. And the things I've shrunk in shrink wrap was all of that. Shrinking things together with shrink wrap, sausage-like things that were linked together now with a tube of shrink wrap, or figuring out how to control shrink wrap so it only shrinks here but not there. And if you poke a hole in it and then shrink it, the hole gets bigger and so on. And so we did some things that were unbelievably beautiful. We did shrink wrap materials that were woven. So woven shrink material, which I wove myself. And then I brought it to a weaver and had them weave it into sheets of material that would shrink. And for instance, we did that. The more we saw how we could make it shrink and what we could make it shrink around, that was where the funniest stuff happened. Not shrinky dinks, are they? Well, no, it wasn't <laughs> shrinky dinks, but we did, for instance, we did some costumes that you could put on you and then shrink them with a hairdryer so they would wrap around you in a certain way. And they were very funny and very exciting. Another one we did was based on some images I had seen from Ghostbusters where these gargoyles broke off the top of the building. And I decided that I would try to get that to happen somehow in things that would break apart. And we ended up going around town, a friend of mine and I around town and buying as much Alka-Seltzer as we could buy. We bought tons of it, tons of Alka-Seltzer. And we compressed it into shapes that we made like gargoyles. So we made these gargoyles out of Alka-Seltzer. 
And when you spray them with vinegar and water, they go crazy. <laughs> so we made all these things that would turn from being these rock solid things into something completely different, which led to the opposite, which was really something we've not been able to exploit yet. But the opposite was strangely impacting an object that we already made inside something made of something very explosive like that when it got wet. And that led to another experiment, which was we made these bird feeders where the outside was this shape and inside was a sculpture that was very recognizable, like Rodin's thinker. And so you didn't see the thinker, you just saw this hunk of stuff on a stick and we put them out in the yard and we had birds come and peck away at it, which they did because it was made from bird seed and eventually the bird would be the one sculpting the Rodin. <laughs> and those were, they're so ridiculous, but you don't sit down and think that out loud. You get to that one day, which is how can I do it? And it's not real. And so these ideas of this material over another material as a toy, a doll that you could walk away with and play with all come from my own play in my studio. And it's messy and it's dirty. And there's scraps that look like something. And you look at them and you say, Actually, the scrap is more important than the thing I made. Forget the thing I made. Let me exploit the scrap. That's what it is. The result of this, the garbage, the leftover, the banana peel, not the banana. And you have to be looking at that stuff all the time to say, I know I'm going down this path over here, but don't forget to look over there because yeah. there's something over the there. The product becomes the product. <laughs> oh my God, it's so much more interesting. And yeah. that happened in the glass business a lot where they were making something and often it gets stuck in the mold if you're using a mold. And the part that got stuck in the mold in one of my actually biggest successes, it's still for sale today because of what it is, was something that got stuck that was a very different thing. And I had nothing to do that. I was walking by watching them try to pull it out of the mold and it was stuck. And when they stretched it like taffy, the end result was so much better than the thing they were making for someone else. And I stole it and I took it and I said, this is a mistake. This is garbage. And this is going to become, this garbage is going to become my piece de resistance. It's exactly what I've been thinking about is how to get there. And the answer was make something very precious and then destroy it. And that destroying of the precious thing led to a very makeable thing over and over again. As long as you could destroy it the same way all the time, you were wrecking something that was so much better when it was wrecked. And I, I fell in love with that process, actually. That's been a thread in a lot of my thinking and work is how do you do it? How do you stretch it? And what happens when you stretch it? You're talking about process again here, really. Totally, enough. completely. And it's not just physical process. You're talking about techniques earlier, but it really is really almost cycling through through a Rolodex of concepts totally. uh, that, that you apply to things to say, what happens if you do this? What happens if you do that? How do you change the state and transform things from one to, to another? Yes. You've got to have a good memory because a lot of that Rolodex is way in the back. And once in a while, something that you're doing sparks your memory to go to the Z section or wherever you've yeah. got to go and say, I they saw that at the candy while. factory. <laughs> And the candy factory and the glass factory have a lot of similarities and the plastics guy as well. And all the things I've seen that have become the future, which are now present, a lot of them are exactly like that in terms of how things really happen and how you can exploit or use your memory of what you were working on. And now you've had time to let it rest and time to let it settle and time to really let it mature in your mind somewhere. And then grab it and say, you know what, that didn't work then, but now I know what to do with it. And these things do mature to the point where now you can deal with them without all that wrestling. You've done it all in your head subconsciously for a long time. And I think for you know anyone who's making things, if it's such a direct process, you're probably not doing anything that interesting. If you keep going back to some of the things you did in the experiments, you can really find your way and start to direct it a little better because you've got this giant library. There's a theme I saw in what you were talking about is whether it was the neighborhood kids tinkering and making stuff or being at a place like RISD where you're around a lot of people making stuff and learning from them or whether you're in factories seeing a lot of people doing this as a job in various levels. Being around other people who make stuff is really important. And, and often what I saw the maker community initially 
was there were a lot of people that were doing this all by themselves and they didn't actually you know know a lot of other people who made stuff because right. we've become such a consumer culture most people don't think it's worth doing why don't more people make stuff today i think there are a lot of reasons and the top line seems to be that making stuff requires stuff and requires space and requires tools and requires a setup and cleanup. And when you're all done making one, you still only have one. And there's a giant cost to that somewhere or another. It's time. It's, it's very personal. And making something that takes a lot of time means it's time away from something or someone else. And it uses up a lot of time to make something that you've never made before. And even if you're making something that you understand, uh, you still may have to do a lot of steps to it to finish it and get it. And when you're all done, you've got one. And you look at that and say, I made this. And it's still not adequate because you'll need to make another one and another. And suddenly you're consumed by it. And there are so many other things to do today which are handed to us. I, I won't say what they are because... People love things that are handed to them. All kinds of games and exciting things that people do today, they're handed to them. They're prepackaged things that you do because people like us have already invented it. Inventing things or working on things, the only proof you have is that one thing you made and people shrug their shoulders and say, I could buy that. I, I, I could get that at a store for nothing. How much? How long did it take you to do that? People want to know, how long did it take you to do that? And they marvel at the, the, the intensity that you put into making that one thing and realize, oh, what a bore, it's one thing. They took them nine weeks to make that thing. I think there's that. But also a lot of things are fun for people when they're collaborative. Team sports are collaborative. A, a band is collaborative. And all those kinds of things happen uh, while making something is often not collaborative. You do it on your own. Certain kinds of people can do that for hours into the night and in the morning and do it again and again. And they don't want opinions. They don't want critiques. They don't want anything from anyone. In fact, they don't even need you to tell them that it's good or bad. They don't care what you think which is very different than a lot of the other things that people do. Where I think the person making something, some things are just junk and they're still right. They're good because you did it. You did it yourself. And I think that that's a very right. different kind of person that approaches things and says, I don't care but, what you think about this. So the creative professions, even when they become professions, are still, to me, the place where a lot of excitement and invention happens for everybody else. If you made music and you made a sound or wrote lyrics that everyone in the world sings tomorrow, it's because you wrote them. And anyone can look at them and say, oh, that's so simple. I could have done it. The answer is you couldn't have, you wouldn't have because you don't have the brass. You don't have the what it takes to put those words down that way. You would never have done it. I hear it all the time. But go back to your earlier point. You'd ask, is this good? You know, and you'd ask, and I think you know it's one of those things. It's it's true of when you talk about the word maker, and and it's like people say, "I'm not creative." Part of my life is one to just disabuse them. You just have to try it, and you will be creative. Yes. But like you were talking about earlier, people that they actually want someone else to say they're creative, and and they know someone won't say that because they won't even try to do it, and, and so they're in this kind of loop. But it's like. Being creative doesn't mean you're good. It just means you're doing stuff and it might look really messy and awful and eventually rein it in or do something with it. But you have to do it before you're good at it, right? Oh, you know? of course. Like you can't study art history and then become an artist. You have to start drawing, right? And You, and, you, you really do. Otherwise, you're just a critic and yeah. a bad one at that. The, the art of playing until you have something, until you have something that you believe in, that you can get behind, is also, it's not necessarily about what do you think about it? What do you think about it? How do you think this tastes? You have to like it yourself. You have to love it. And that that's the part too, is that I think with lots of people who are creating things, is that aside from falling in love with it, but you might fall in love with something or just know that it is what it's supposed to be. And I guarantee you, there are a million other people out there, which is no small market. If you could sell a million of anything, there is a million people that would feel exactly the same way. That's not our job, though. That's marketing's job to reach them. They're out there in this world. They're out there. What are you doing during COVID? What's your life like over the last year? I'm doing a lot more drawing and I've taken a lot more away from the electronic digital world for a moment. I am cobbling things together. I am experimenting with stuff. And 
I am drawing a lot, which is a way to play simply because you're not telling the drawing what it's supposed to do or what it's supposed to be. And a lot of my work then is my response to my own drawing. And what the next drawing could or should be is you know, implied in the previous one. And so I have this process and I, I make a, a lot of things like that right now that are, for the moment, go nowhere, but I know how to make them go somewhere. I'm a professional at this point and I know how to take clay and turn it into something that I believe will have some kind of value, intrinsic or extrinsic or fundamental answer to something or a problem solve that maybe didn't exist. And some people look at it and say, huh, I didn't realize you could do that. Or that's so funny, I have that same problem and that's something a lot of people have. And so I'm spending a lot of time this year doing that. I'm not solving COVID, I'm not curing cancer, I'm not doing any of that right now, but I am experimenting and playing a lot. And this time is rare actually for many of us. It affords me to do things like that, that I couldn't do being under the gun for deadlines and things like that. And so it's almost strangely refreshing, if you will, take the time, you need time to play. And this has been actually a good time to do that in lots and lots of ways. Pressure is good sometimes for inventors. Last minute ideas are incredible sometimes and that's important too. So you need a bit of both. You can't just yeah. you know meander forever. You could, but right. I think that when you've got some pressure, the meandering stops, you get down to business and you know how to you know squeeze it out based on all the things you've done. It's a cumulative sort of thing like the library, like the Rolodex. I saw something so interesting where a guy was using literally sand and a handmade 3D printing gantry that he would drag across the sand with a laser to melt the sand into glass and then take the sand box and lower it a little bit with these two cranks. It was very crude using real technology and a computer and some solar panels. And when I saw him doing that and making a thing in glass that was crude, I thought, how interesting you could print not print, you could melt glass using a, a gantry like a 3D printer anywhere in the world, just set it up anywhere. And you could size it, it scales up and it scales down. W what else could you do? And my thinking was, I wonder if he thought about doing that with ice instead of sand. And I don't know who's doing stuff with 3D printing and ice right now, but whether melting it or building things with water that's in a frozen refrigerator, but building things in a refrigerator or a freezer using a 3D printer that prints water as a spray or as drops or as lines, I don't know, but that's the thing is I so badly want to make a printer that prints ice in a freezer into shapes or into something that ice is really good at. Ice is like glass and ice can be made into lenses I've seen and you can start a fire with a lens made of ice. And I think those sorts of things, I don't know if it's a toy because I love lighting fires <laughs> and lighting one out of an ice lens would be a, a kid's dream come true. If they could print a lens and start a fire with it, that's the kind of stuff that makes you think, who is this? Who's crazy enough to think this stuff up? And the answer is no one on their own. It is cumulative things in the world. And again, if you flip them upside down, sometimes you now have something new. Thank you for listening to MakeCast. If you enjoyed this program, please share it with a friend.